We're going to bring our uh, guest in for tonight now and uh, see if he has any skills he's picked up during lockdown as well. Welcome, Ian. Good to see you. Good to be here. Oh. Sorry, I forgot to put your mic on. There you go. We're there now. <laughs> Hello there. Good to be here. How are you doing? I'm all right. You? Yeah, it is good to see you. Um, we've caught up a few times during lockdown. We had a good meeting on Sunday night, didn't we, where we uh, you started a film club up. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so. yeah I guess that's one of the, the new skills I've learned. <laughs> yes, but it was nice. It was nice just speaking with people that you didn't know and, you know, I never met before, but we've all got that connection in, with you. Um, yeah. And uh, it was a good atmosphere. It was good. So how, how are things going? Just tell us a little bit about where you, where you are and, and what it is you're doing at the moment. So I'm in Clitheroe at the moment, and I'm um, a curate at St James's Church in Clitheroe. Um, yeah, so I'm with, with the Church of England now, uh, ordained as a deacon a couple of years ago as priest last year. So yeah, I've got another year here, and then I'll be um, looking for my first incumbency and first church to lead. Wonderful, wonderful. Now that's not where you started. You started up here in in good old Billingham, didn't you? I did. Uh, yeah. This is where you grew up, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that's where I was born um, and stayed there till I was nineteen, I think. Yeah. So did that. Um, yeah, miss it a lot. Loved it. And um, we met, of course, when you were living in Billingham because you were part of New Life Church. And when I started first coming, in fact, actually, you kind of took me under your wing a little bit and looked after me when I was new. I tried my best. <laughs> I can't have been, can't have been easy. <laughs> I don't know. I, it was one of the things that, I don't know, I just tried to make people feel welcome in my loudmouth northern way. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to just tell us, um, you know, how, how you first got involved in your life? Because you, you, you didn't come from a Christian family, did you? No, um, so I think because I was in the area and I used to just hang around and stuff, um, I was aware of New Life. I think I popped in a couple of times when I was like quite young in primary school or something and on a Sunday morning, I remember they had them orange chairs with the holes in um, and I just remember thinking, because I didn't have any experience at church and thought that it was just all a bit strange to me. And then when I was... Um, when I was in second year of Logrange Juniors, a boy came to the to our school who came moved from down south near London um, called Mark, and he used to go to the church. But he spoke with a funny accent, and I remember in, in assembly once he got up and talked about the different books of the Bible and listed them all in order. <laughs> so I kind of got to know him, and he used to invite me to church a lot, but I never really never really went along. And I think when I was about 14, I used to play a lot of football and I was playing football on, actually it might have been the, it was Bede College then, their field. And then I walked over and just between Logan's juniors and the infants, as it was then, there was a group of people playing football there and they just weren't really very good. So I just stood watching for a bit and this Mark said, do you want to come and play? And I said, yeah, yeah. And there's loads of girls watching. I remember that. So that was what piqued my interest, I think, that these girls were watching. So... And then after we'd finished playing football, he said, do you want to come over to the church to, for the youth club to play table tennis and different things? And I said, are the girls going to go? And he said, yeah. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll come see what it's like. And I went along and I think um, enjoyed the table tennis and different things and went into the main hall. And yeah, Steve talked about Jesus. And it was the first time I'd heard any message about Jesus outside of school assemblies or songs from the Common Prayers book, uh, I'd heard anything like it. And I kept going back each week, mainly for the girls, but there was something in the the rest of it that, um, that yeah, that spoke to me on some level. And when when for you, so you're coming along, and, and you know, I, that's one of the things that originally hooked me in was the friendships, people. And it's it's easy to start coming along for that. You hear a bit of the message, but when when did it, really hit home for you when did you really find yourself in that position where you're like actually you know I've got to do something about this I think that first night when I heard Steve speak it was like it was like something I'd never heard before it was it was like you mean it's relevant to me now it's not just a song that we sing in school and it was about this and it started then and I met God in the what if really what if it is true hmm. what if he did die for me 
What if he does love me more than anything else? What if I am created for a purpose, on purpose? And and that was when it started. Um, it didn't. I didn't respond then, but I remember those questions coming up then at what was it, fourteen years old, um, and then they just wouldn't leave me. And I think I did, and I got more involved in church. Started coming on Sundays, and you know, got to to build really good relationships. But part of me, I think, people were always interested and in, told me they were praying for me and wanted me to become a Christian. And I think I liked that attention hmm. to a degree. And I thought as soon as I say I'm a Christian, that will stop. So I think I believed in my heart, but I never confessed with my mouth. So I just carried on for a bit. I loved where I was. But I think over the course of maybe the first year that I was going, that I really was asking those big questions and searching. And really, without ever saying it, I really felt that it was true. That's that's good, and uh, so it was. It was sort of this sense of you, you knew it was. True. It started with what if, and but then became something you knew was true. Um, yeah. Now, as you developed and, and began your walk with that, um, your life became very much committed to living this out in every. You know, you you, you went down to um, where was the first place you went? Was it Litchfield? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, and you, you really jumped in with two feet and committed yourself to, to serving God full time. Um, what, what did it take for you to make that, that step into doing that? I, I always think, I mean, whether it was God or Pastor Cliff, but I think genuinely I was stitched up a bit. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> we went as a church retreat or week away to, to Elm House, to Redmire. And we were there and... Um, there was a, the guy, Richard, I think it was, from Spenny Moon was speaking, and he said, I want all the young people to come out the front and I want to pray for them. So I was like, well, I'm not going to sit here on my own. So I went out the front and he put his hand on my head. Can't remember anything he said. Can't remember anything response. And then I went and sat back down. Didn't say I'd do anything. And then on the evening, the meeting, Pastor Cliff got up and I was chatting away to Corny or something. And Pastor Cliff got up and said, oh, I just want to tell everybody um, some great news that Ian Sargentson gave his life to Jesus this morning. And I was like, did I? <laughs> I had no idea. Everyone's clapping, crying, hugging me, um, you know, pr shouting praise the Lord. So I thought, well, I can't, I can't back out now. <laughs> so I went outside and said, look, God, if this is what you want for my life, then, then I'll give you everything but please don't let my friends at school find out. So that was my first <laughs> prayer. But yeah, I committed right there and then and said, right, if this is what you want, then then that's it. So then from there, I was all in, really. There's um, there's, there's, there's some um, in, who may be watching now um, who are children of people who come to the church and, and maybe find themselves in that similar position where they're like, you know... <sighs> And I, I, I know there's something, but this idea of committing, this idea of stepping out, this idea of people in school finding out that uh, that I follow Jesus, that I go to church, I, I don't know how to deal with that. What would you say to encourage them? I would say that you, you need to almost get the preconceived ideas out of your head about what a Christian is. Because ultimately I thought, oh, my friends are going to um, laugh at me, they're going to make fun of me, they're going to be, because I... But they, they would have only done that if I had conformed to the stereotype they had. So I wanted to challenge those stereotypes. I wanted to be a Christian, but still be me. So I tried to do that. I tried to make sure that, you know what I mean, I was authentic within that. So I would just say, don't worry about that. And when it came to it, and I told my friends, it wasn't some like, guess what, guys? I became a Christian yesterday. I'm washed in the blood. It was more like, it came up in everyday conversation and they just didn't care. Do you know, mm. they weren't bothered. They thought it was great. And they said, yeah, we knew you went to church and it was just a, such a non-event um, that it didn't happen. Now I know that some people did get made fun of and stuff, but I think you've just got to be true to yourself. It's much bigger than what anyone can say to you. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So you were expecting this barrage of, um, what's the word of, of um, persecution, yeah. And actually what you got was uh, maybe a bit of disinterest and maybe some questions. 
Yeah, it was a shrug of the shoulders, and then they would ask me things because it just came up like they were saying, "What did you do at the weekend?" And I was like, oh, "I played football Saturday, went to church Sunday, and then, you know, had a dinner or something." And it was just that. And then they were like, "Oh, you went to church? Yeah, yeah." So then, why did you go to church? And then we'd just get in a conversation. It wasn't like I wanted to gather them round and you know tell them a story about what a parable or something. It was just it just came up in everyday conversation. Hmm. And um, then you moved, you, so you moved away from, from Billy and you went to Litchfield, then you went to Southport. Yeah. And you were there for a good few years. Um, and b- something big and, uh, well, really significant happened to you in Southport. What was that? Dude, there's a few things. That, do you think, <laughs> it depends what you're talking about. You're I have, talking I have about one Kate? in mind. <laughs> you're talking about Kate? I am, yeah. <laughs> right, okay, yes, I met, who is now my wife, um, so I met Kate there, yeah, so that was... I mean, I had loads of great times in Southport, but if it was only for that, then it was a total blessing. Yeah. Now, you, so you, you, you were saved in a Pentecostal church. Um, yeah. You went to Litchfield Pentecostal Church. Yeah. You went to Southport Pentecostal Church. You are now in the Church of England as a... a, a, a what, is priest the right word? Yeah, I'm a priest now. I'm ordained priest. as a priest. Your dog collar, everything, yes? Yeah, yeah, do all that. But the robes, <laughs> I don't wear them that often, no, the robes. <laughs> how, how did God take you on that on that journey? So we were leaving Southport. We uh, we left Southport because Kate got a job in Cumbria. So I had to find something locally. And I'd, uh, I'd, my last few years at Southport, I'd been working as a full time schools worker, and it was em- I was employed by a group of churches. And my line manager um, was the Church of England vicar. So I got on with him. It was fine. His church wasn't that different to anything I'd seen before, but I didn't go on Sundays, so I knew that. So then when I we, we were moving to Cumbria, I looked for a job, and there was, I saw one in Lancaster that was in a Church of England church. Um, so I thought, well, it, the stuff that they're looking for as a youth worker, it seems fairly straightforward. Um, the website looks normal. Do you know what I mean? They seem to be outward-focused, a lot of similarities. Um So I asked this guy, Stuart, can you write me a reference? And he said, yeah. And he also said at the time, I'll write you a reference when you get ordained as well. And I just laughed. And I said to him, there's no way I will ever get ordained in the Church of England. (laughs) So there's God with a sense of humour. But yeah, so I took that job at Lancaster as a youth worker there. I was there for four and a half years, great years, um, really worked. And although there was some differences that I found out and I I made a few four pars, but yeah, yeah. it wasn't too different. And, and then within that, I really felt the call to to church leadership. And then I was kind of stuck because do I go back to change denomination again? Do I go back to um, a Pentecostal church or an Elim church or something and start again? And then as you know, you've got to serve in the church and there'd be a, a process to go through. And people in the Church of England at St. Thomas's and Lancaster kept saying, oh, you should get ordained in the Church of England. We need more priests like you, which I took as a compliment. <laughs> um, and I spoke to Kate about it, and I wanted to plant the church. And um, But she rightly and wisely said, but you can't just do it on your own. You need some kind of covering. I don't want you really going off as a renegade. You need right. some accountability. So I said, all right. I said, this is what we'll do. I said, I will pursue this door in the Church of England because I'm fully convinced that I'm not what they're looking for. I'm not what a Church of England vicar looks like, talks like, acts like. So as soon as they close the door on that, am I okay to do what I want? And Kate said, yes. And they never did. (laughs) They never, nobody stopped me and here we are (laughs) in some kind of, so I I just let, I I trusted God in that process, not, not for one second thinking that I would get further. Hmm. Then that's and yeah, and it carried on. And the more I went through that process, the more I realized that I could serve within that. Um, there was a lot that I loved about the way the Church of England works, um, and and some obviously some things that were still alien to me, but because it's quite a broad church, I found that I could be myself within it, yeah. So I found a comfortable fit now, yeah, that's good. And I guess when you said you, you know, you don't talk like, look like, you know, act like someone who's a Church of England uh, vicar, I guess. That turns out that's a good thing. I mean, they do yeah, need I mean, more Yeah, I mean, that was people. just my prejudices. It yeah. was just what I, again, preconceived. So there's all kinds of Church of England vicars, but what I had in my head was 
based on the narrow view I had and the media and all of these things. Um, so I was worried. There's a bit of an imposter syndrome going on. So I was worried, you know, I didn't talk properly. I wasn't middle class enough. I didn't do. But yeah, as soon as there was support for that from people high up in the Church of England who were opposite to me in a lot of ways, that they supported me and supported me in that role. Hmm. I just felt, yeah, I can, I can do this. I can be me within this. Um, can I ask? It's kind of an awkward question. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to. <laughs> I realise you're working within the Church of England now, and I don't want you to be critical of it. No, okay. <laughs> um, but have you found this has presented you with opportunity um, in some of the churches you've been involved with to actually share the gospel with people who have been attenders? But have never really opened up to the, you know, to to really follow in Jesus. Does, does it give you opportunity to do that? Yeah, I think so. And I think it, it's not exclusive to the Church of England, but I think a lot more people have inherited Church of England attendance than maybe my experience in Pentecostal churches that hmm. they belong to a parish and their parents have always gone and they went to Sunday school, so they've gone. They sang in the choir. They've sat in the pews for years. That, um, but. Beyond that, it's, and I'm not saying that isn't okay, but beyond that, there's no deeper expression or no other expression of of their faith. Um, so that has happened, but it hasn't been something that I've sought out. It's just naturally who I am. So naturally, that's the place where I come from, that whether even in the Pentecostal church, if you've been gone for 20, 30 years, it doesn't, it doesn't mean do you know what I mean? Your faith has to be more than just a church attendance. Yes, absolutely, and that's and I think that's great, and I think it's it gives you such a, a wonderful scope to be able to to speak that into people, and uh, you know I'm, I think it's a great thing that you're doing there, and uh, you know I think it's it's wonderful. Can I, can I just ask you, um, just away on time, um, if there's somebody watching who is in a similar position to you, you know, they've, they've, they've been going along to a church sort of mainly for the, you know, the connections with people. Um, and I think maybe, maybe there's something in this, but they're not, not sure. And I guess that is the what if question crops up. What, what would you say to those people? Yeah, I would say what if, uh, sit in the what if and hold that in front of you, but then ask questions. So, I mean, Pastor Cliff will tell you, I used to ask questions all the time. If he said something, I wouldn't just take it because the pastor said it, because he said it was in the Bible. I would want to know why. And I'd ask them questions because I think for your faith to be fully genuine, you, it has to be, you have to examine it. You ha it. There has to be some kind of looking at it and working with it and wrestling with the whole theology of God and who he is and his plan for us. To do it. So yeah, I would say ask questions, find out as much as you can, wherever the gaps are in your knowledge, um, try and educate yourself. But ultimately, it's a heart thing. So you can learn so much with your head and understand more and whatever that is. But the what if is always going to be the biggest question. That's good. What if that's true? Um, and then to another set of people um, who have been in a similar position to you as well, if they find themselves on that cusp of the feel actually they're being called not just to step out into a ministry but into something that's taken them away from even where they, they live, the place they've grown up, the place they've known and they feel this hesitancy to do it. Um, what encouragement could you give to them? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, just be be strong in the calling. So it's not about waiting for the exact time and location. Sometimes that comes, but sometimes it's about realising that God has created you um, for a purpose, and that purpose is sometimes going to be bigger than the place you currently find yourself. So it didn't matter where I went. So it wasn't always like I heard a booming voice from God saying, I want you to go to Southport. I mean, I'm glad that that did happen. But I just thought, this will be a good idea. I hope I can serve there. I hope I can have an influence. I hope I can be a good impact, not just in the church, but in the community and, and everywhere, and have a great time. So, yeah, I would just say... Um, just don't limit yourself and don't limit God that's good that's good thank you so much and thank you for joining us tonight I've really no loved having you with us and, and just chatting with you it's been, it feels like it's been a while doesn't it <laughs> since, yeah it's been a while yeah since you've been up I'm in the sure area there's loads well. of people in new life who don't even know who I am 
<laughs> yes, it's, it has. It's been it's been that long, but um, we're keeping you in prayer as well in all that you're doing in Clitheroe, and it's great to I keep keep getting the updates on Facebook as to what's going on there. And uh, you're doing a great job down there. Thank you. 